involve employees in decision-making processes and in implementing sustainable, fair and democratic strategies to the benefit of workers and the surrounding communities of the companies. In the 90s, I got inspired by Davy Cooperwriter, who developed a concrete change management methodology called appreciative inquiry to guide businesses as an angel for world benefit. Later, we have seen how CSR, ESGs, and the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals have inspired businesses and organizations all over the world to lead and act in a sustainable and democratic way. The panel today will discuss the call for businesses to be more democratic, more under the control of all staff, the unions, investors, even customers. We'll discuss how you can incorporate employees into company matters, from decision-making to ownership to what it looks like in real life. We'll discuss the benefit and the willingness of new managers to assume the risk-taking of previous era top managers. We'll also discuss what new collective goals might look like and what different sectors, companies, and organizations have already done and could do in the future to democratize businesses. With this short introduction, I would like to welcome our esteemed panel who are with us here today to discuss the topic of influencing leaders to democratize business. In the panel, we have Bernhard Bauhofer, founder and CEO of Sparing Partners, pioneer reputation management based out of Switzerland. Since the year 2000, Bernhard Bauhofer has been pioneering the corporate reputation management discipline in Switzerland and Europe. Within the reputation management business model, all relevant factors such as innovation, human resources, communications, corporate governance, and CEO are concertedly deployed. The client roster of sparing partners encompasses leading companies in the financial, healthcare, retail, and IT industry throughout Europe. We also have Sam Glassenberg, Chief Executive Officer and founder of LevelX, based out of the US. Sam has spent his career at the cutting edge of the video games industry. He began his career at Lucasfilm and Microsoft, where he accepted a technical Emmy on behalf of his team for their work to advance the state of the art in interactive entertainment. He has built two game companies that were successfully acquired. He is currently the CEO of Level X, a medical video game studio that uses the technology and neuroscience of games to accelerate the adoption of new techniques in medicine. And we have Christina Alfonso, co-founder of Madeira Global, also based out of the US. Christina is a longtime ESG expert, having served as founder and CEO of Madeira Global, an ESG advisory and reporting firm for 10 years prior to its sale to Simbria Capital in late 2020. Today, she serves as ESG Senior Advisor to Simbria Capital, as well as Chief Strategy Officer of Parlay for the Oceans. She is a frequent global speaker on issues pertaining to corporate governance and stakeholder alignment. And we have John Blakey, founder of the Trusted Executive Foundation based out of the United Kingdom. The Trusted Executive Foundation is a non-for-profit organization that helps board leaders across all sectors adapt to the new normal of trust-based leadership using the unique models and tools from John's books, The Trusted Executive, and Challenging Coaching. The Trusted Executive book combines prize-winning research to create the nine habits of trust at Aspen Business School together with the learnings from John's successes, maybe also some failures, as a former FTSE 100 International Managing Director and Serial Entrepreneur. The book was shortlisted as the Chartered Management Institute Book of the Year in 2017. And here we have Kumba as well with us today. Uh, Kumba is the chairman of Africa Development Futures Group, also based out of the US. Mr. Kumba is lecturer, faculty, affiliate of the Science, Technology and Public Policy Program and member of the STEM Africa Initiative at the University of Michigan. He's also the chairman of the Africa Development Futures Group and senior fellow with the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils. So now with this short introduction, let me give the word to our esteemed panelists themselves. Starting out with you, Bernard, could you please give us your opening remark on the topic of this panel, why you are maybe perhaps excited to be here today? Thank you very much, Penilla. I'm very excited to, to join you. 
uh, in this international panel, and I think the uh, the topic is very interesting. Um, our approach, as you mentioned in the introduction, is we looking at the, the different stakeholders and constituencies of a company, um, which goes far beyond the shareholder value paradigm. Um, I think uh, each company is understanding that uh, shareholder value is not the only value driver of a company, but it is much more all constituencies have to be to taken into consideration in, within the business approach. So I think now, due to the interconnectedness of, of the stakeholders of a company and um, the increasing transparency in general, and the amount of information stakeholders have, they have an unprecedented power uh, to influence a company and a company's leadership and management in order to uh, fulfill uh, different expectations of different stakeholders and um, also with respect to environmental issues like ESG uh, criteria and so forth. So I think this is a fantastic situation we are facing now for dem democratize um, the business culture and with the effect to um, really change the corporate culture towards a open and transparent culture involving all stakeholders. Thank you so much. And what about you, Sam? What would your opening remarks be? Uh, sure. Well, look, I this is certainly the first panel that I've ever attended on the subject of, of this kind of democratization of business. Um, usually I'm on panels about video game technology and VR and medicine. Um, but I think this is a fascinating topic and I'm looking forward to engaging with the group and thank you for having me. Um, I think that you know, one of the positive transformations that we've, it seems to be resulting from the COVID pandemic is somewhat of an increased democratization of businesses, uh, you know, has, has been described here, right? So this is a result, I think, of new technology combined with some new social dynamics that are emerging. I mean, one of the things that's just interesting to see is when you're on Zoom all day, there are no corner offices. There's no executive meeting room. We're all squares of the same size. I mean, I guess I could I could make myself big or small, but that's that's about the limit of it. Um, and everyone gets the same real estate on screen, and that you know, which I think is is sort of has has some interesting democratizing effects. That maybe we'll talk about later. Um, I think that in general, that that feeling around the office that we used to have from being in the same physical space is no longer something that can be felt um, when everyone's online all day. And I think it's forcing companies to communicate with the breadth of their employees and really, like, literally. And that's a two-way communication that really comes down to often bringing things to a vote. Um, I can say like at Level X, almost our entire COVID strategy as a company uh, was driven by what amounted to various forms of company-wide democratic voting um, through a range of different technical tools that we use for it. Should we return to the office? When? Under what terms? What should the rules be? You know, it doesn't matter like what the executives think or want. Um, this is a decision that is now made as an entire company. I think this is just one example, but we're seeing a lot more of this um, in a COVID universe. Tools like Slack, if used correctly, and that's, of course, a big, a big if, um, can really bring increased transparency to an organization and really start distributing decision making among different levels. Um, so I think there's a lot that technology can do to democratize business. Um, and on a separate note, I'm very excited about, you know, and we'll talk about this later, ma major component of democratizing business by including customers in company decision making. Awesome. So you're also talking about leveling the playing field and how much trust it must require also of you as a leader of a company to actually distribute that power to employees to ask into it. And I know you've written a book about that, John, something uh, with trust. And uh, what, what's your take on this in your opening remark? Yeah, thank you, Penilla. And uh, great, great to be here and great to be amongst the other uh, panelists tonight. And yeah, I've been researching trust since 2012. Um, after the uh, global financial crisis, I think we recognized that something was shifting. In the in the leadership, permanent and 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 really, when I when I started to shine a, my own lens on that, this word trust emerged center stage. And one of my favorite quotes about trust is from an author, Charles Green, who says that what the world needs right now are leaders who rely on the power of trust rather than leaders who trust in power. Uh, and I think that's the shift that we're experiencing. And and Sam has has talked about how the the pandemic is accelerating the trends that were already present but have been turbocharged in the last 15 months. Obviously, the, the speed of this varies depending upon which part of the world, which sector you're in. But I think there's a, a general, um, the currency of leadership, which used to be power, I think is devaluing um, and the currency of trust is, is increasing in value for leaders. So the risks of relying on power in your leadership, uh, command and control and authority and position, I think are getting greater. 
and the opportunities of relying on trust uh, and, and that democratic culture is getting greater. Um, so my own research was really to try and help leaders who get this and want to um, lead and pioneer in this area and, and, and to use a behavioral model. So we have three pillars of trust, ability, integrity and benevolence. And then we have three habits under each pillar. So for leaders that really want to get practical with this and go from the theory to the, the practice of democratizing trust, then it really comes down to their own behavior because one of the outputs of my own research was that the biggest single factor in building a high trust culture is the behavior of the CEO and the senior leadership team. So if that team gets it and they start to behave differently uh, in a more democratic um, environment, then the rest of the culture will, will follow. Um, so that's the responsibility of being around that boardroom table, but it's also the opportunity. And I think it's a really exciting time for leaders to, to seize this, uh, this moment and, uh, and, and, and step forward to, uh, to bravely um, capitalize on the opportunity we're going to have in the next 12 months. Yeah, and we're going to come back to that benevolence uh, thing and also the, the question you're talking about, you know, putting it into a model that, that people can actually uh, factor themselves in and see themselves in. And Christina, I know you also have been working not only with ESG, but also with trust and how to uh, make sure that companies uh, get the, the benefit of actually thinking and acting this way. What's your opening remarks and thoughts on this? Yeah, I think Sam brought up uh, many of the great, you know, advantages, I think, uh, that have sprung out of, you know, sort of the needs basis uh, of, of the COVID pandemic. Um, however, I guess as a result, I'll play the devil's advocate um, in terms of some of the downsides. I think that, you know, some of the things that businesses are facing today that challenge the democratization of their business um, is, is, is a sense of lost visibility, at, at various levels of the organization, you know, at, as a result of this uh, sort of digital relationship, um, and then and then and then the word relationship, you know, we've lost a lot of that, um, and so a lot a lot of times, um, you know, just the the ability to um, you know know one another and treat one another with respect is is something that again this environment has lost so i'm used to working in the area of esg reporting and g being the sort of the governance piece as we know the esg has really experienced a much broader adoption over the course of the last 10 years and so generally when i'm working with clients i'm looking at you know aspects of governance that enable democratization to proliferate through an organization looking at things like accountability checks and balances transparency um, you know looking at ethics risks um, these are these are still equally important today um, however um, as I said we, we are challenged because of the current environment and I, I don't envision that we're just automatically going to uh, go back to our old ways um, in terms of corporate culture so I think we really need to think very carefully about how we intend for um, leadership to to command to this subject of democratization yeah, it's thank you for that, and also for bringing up new perspectives in terms of uh, uh, talking about what this leveling of the playing field brings with it of, of hardships as well and challenges. And Kumba, over to you. What's your opening remarks on this topic? Yes, thank you, and uh, thanks to Frank, uh, my good friend. This is my uh, fourth uh, Horace uh, that I'm uh, participating in, and it's always a pleasure to be with uh, colleagues like yourself. Uh, I come from, from a little different background, uh, academia, and uh, while uh, my colleagues are complimentary on uh, the, the details of opening a company, you know, some of us see this uh, as uh, an issue of how business schools train their future leaders, the kind of uh, models that have uh, dominated the training the philosophy behind what it means to run a company, the definitions of return of in, on, on investment, on corporate performance. Now we are in a transitional point where um, uh, the value system, the corporate value system needs to be expanded a little bit. And uh, the best place, as some of us think, is to look at the training of those future leaders because otherwise much work is done within the company that goes against the grain of the leadership that's been trained to do things in, in a certain way. 
And so leadership training, MBA programs, academia, how do they now redefine within the context of the new uh, uh, ESGs, SDGs? Are those even part of the corporate training structure? How uh, can uh, the leadership that is trained to look at things a certain way drive certain kind of competitiveness, certain kind of uh, profitability now be expected to redefine things when they get now to, uh, to, to perform, when the, uh, the measures of performance are different. So we think uh, there's a long-term view to it as opposed to trying to change companies right away and look at the CEOs as individual per company performance. But look at it as a culture. What, what, what are the underlying theories of the economic field? You know, going from socialism versus capitalism. Now we've seen how the environment and many factors about income, income disparities are affecting global governance, society, the planet, our survival. How then can those theories be updated so that some of these factors that affect our survival are put on the table and profitability is not only seen as whatever brings you the dollar at the minimum cost, but a shared commons, a shared good. I think that would provide room for not just short term, like you know, within a few years of what, what a CEO does for the India company or shareholders play a role or not, but how is a transition? The COVID gives a little inflection point in our economic history. Where, 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 where things lead to after this is very, very obvious that they will be good or bad. No, in the, in the, I, I would actually really like to bring you back into the table, Sam, with, with your thoughts on, on academia and gaming and how that can mm-hmm. make complement each other. And do you think there's something to, to get out of, uh, of that, bringing that into academia and business schools? Look, I mean, I think that um, if there's anything that we have in common with academia, and this, you know, goes to some of the topics that were just raised with regard to sort of the, the human psychology, um, in the video games industry over the last three decades, you know, we have distilled a um, a recipe for, you know, for educating, training, and changing behavior at scale among any audience. Um, there's a knowledge and, and sort of applied uh, applied uh, applied experience with neuroscience that we've gained in the games industry that in many ways complements the work that's being done in academia. Um, understanding, you know, how do you hit the perfect, the expert game designer knows how to hit the perfect balance of reward and frustration, challenge and skill to literally maximize dopamine releases in the brain um, to maximize learning. Um, and there's a lot also that we can learn about the social dynamics as well. Um, and a lot of applied also say economics that are used to, you know, create the economic environments in which games play. So I think there is, you know, there is a lot of overlap between the work that, and a lot of collaboration going on between the video games industry and uh, academia um, in the areas of, of neuroscience and economics, which align directly with the topics that we're covering here. Yeah. And, and in terms of democratizing businesses, I know that you also have some thoughts on that, Bernard, with regards to, thinking about how the reputation and the management around around how you deal with actually the platform and the internet and what's going on there in terms of how the the company is seen and leaders are seen what's what's your take on that i think i agree with most of the speakers uh, panelists that um, leadership and um, um, what you said before that the top management is crucial in terms of uh, reputation building and how they behave and how they act as a as a leader who is really inviting stakeholders and all constituencies to participate in the, in the culture and in the value creation of the company and also take ownership. I think that's key. But I think the democratization is such a huge uh, field and a broad field. And um, I think when it comes to crisis management, this comes to a limit, right? Then you really need a strong leader and then uh, who really takes action and, and knows what he has to do. Keeping in mind, of course, all the expectation when it comes to um, environmental issues, when it comes to governance issues and so forth. But at the same time, good example is, for instance, um, Novartis and, um, and its unboss strategy, which really wants to cut hierarchy and really wants to drive uh, democratization within all constituencies, particularly with, with the staff. But... Um, we're seeing exactly from this from this example that with the crisis in the U.S., the Novartis boss uh, uh, had to really take action, and, and like almost in a in a in a um, 
in, well, in a single-minded way and, and, and just do work as a crisis manager. So we see this opening uh, process ha has come to a limit. Uh, and I think one has to balance between inviting people in taking ownership and collaborating and communicating and really put, putting pressure on the management at the same time. It is a, as a, the main purpose of a company is making profit and then also, of course, uh, serving the shareholders while like, not forgetting the stakeholders. So also talking about uh, managing and balancing this and, and maybe not going too far out in extremes. Is that also something that you would like to to talk about when you talk about trust, uh, John? Yeah, I, ju I just want to you know pick up on some of the things that the people are saying because I think I think there's, there's we've got an interesting group of people here because we're looking at different um, aspects of this of this challenge and and uh, and I just want to pick up on Combo's point about education and MBAs and uh, you know I spent a lot of time in business schools I'm I'm a practical business person but I've been, I spent a lot of time in business schools and um, I've never been on the introduction to benevolence course for for senior leaders, you know, I mean, benevolence is one of these three pillars of, of, of trust, but I have never learned about it on an MBA course. I never been mentored in it by leaders in, in business. You know, if you, if, if you brought benevolence, it was because it was like a nice to have because you were a human being. Um, but in the world of trust, you have to um, have that benevolence alongside the ability and the integrity. And I think this is the, this is the education challenge that I think Comba is is alluding to that we have a whole generation of leaders that have been brought up with a certain perception of what the game is, you know, what the purpose of business is and what the behaviors that are appropriate in a boardroom. And, and these, these need to change. The purpose is changing. I think with ESG and, and the, 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 the um, you know, different uh, sort of triple bottom line focus of, of business, the purpose is changing, but I think the behaviors are not changing as fast as we would like to think. There's a lot of um, of a veneer, you know. We have like a veneer of uh, of a different culture, but the but if you scratch that veneer, I think it's it's often quite thin, because there is so much uh, education and conditioning that yeah. we've got in our blood that we have to sort of work out. And it's going to take it's going to take a, a generation of leaders to really um, move that forward. And uh, I think that Kumbar's right that we need to focus on the, the future leaders as well as the existing CEOs, because the existing CEOs need to give the give the permission for these new leaders to emerge. Mm -hmm. And then these new leaders need to have the bravery to step forward and, and challenge, really challenge the status quo that we have in some of these uh, cultures, because, because my generation is not going to do this. Uh, we, the best we can do is create the opportunity for the next generation to step forward. And, and, and that's that bit of it that I'm really focused on. So what's your take on that, Christina? Uh, do you agree or do you think that maybe the ESGs and, and other factors could actually help also drive this generation? I think that I, I don't disagree. I, I think that we are going to be moving more towards a regulatory environment or, or reporting requirements that are going to take this all into consideration and, and, and in many cases make it mandatory for companies of a certain size uh, to operate within a certain governance structure. Um, and so, I mean, I mean, as it pertains to, you know, diversity, which I think is a, is a huge pillar within this topic. Um, I absolutely believe in the benefits of, you know, just diversity adding to uh, enhanced group dynamics, enriching debate, um, you know, including the, the diverse points of view that are ultimately going to lead to more informed decision making within, um, you know, within corporate leadership. Um, so I, I think the, the pressure will really come down when we're, when we're, um, when we're looking at what I hope is a certain um, standardization and, and, and requirement. So this rising demand that we're talking about and, and that some people are, feel is there, do you all agree and chip in whenever you feel you have something to say about this, do you all agree that there is a rising demand or is it just something that a uh, few elitist people would actually like to believe there, there is a rising demand for democratizing business? I, I think this, we have a systemic issue. I think if we... In some sense, it's wishful thinking that this is going to change to good. Of course, we have ESG criteria, we have pressure from ESG goals, um, and we have all this. But 
the system still is that the CEO is, as you guys said, um, educated to drive profitability of a company, to increase the shareholder value. And then after three or four years, he's gone. And then um, the board is looking for a replacement, right? And I think we have also supervisory board is playing a key role within its strate strategy uh, responsibility to, to implement this um, change of culture uh, with a long-term perspective. And this would also include that they have really an agreement with the key institutional uh, investors because they have the true power to drive change within a company. Um, and it's more a systemic agreement of all key constituencies to a long-term um, and, and um, sustainable change in which we are discussing here. But on the basis of what is happening now, I don't think that this is... Um, what you said, John, if you scratch the surface, you see you're still living in the same old world, which is shareholder value trade, right? And then we have the ESG criteria. I, I moderate a um, sustainable finance um, conference, and the, the reality is that many, many companies and investment companies and wealth managers are not applying this criteria. And uh, I think the big pressure has to come from the big players who um, they just said, if you don't follow these rules, you're out. We don't consider you anymore. And that's uh, BlackRock and, and the big ones. And they have the power in the, in the very end. So that, that's a take. And uh, we also have the take of the gaming industry maybe helping us out a little bit here. <laughs> and what about academia, Kumba? Could you add a little bit more on, on your thoughts on that? How uh, do we need to change the curriculum? Or what, what's your take? Actually, I'm not... Uh, I think we more than have to change the curriculum. It would be an imperative very soon. The ESGs are uh, an attempt by the international community, the UN, to push certain values into the corporate sector, to invite the uh, industrial sector to play a role in mitigating the, uh, the, uh, the, the repercussions of their previous two, three centuries of activities climate change and uh, environmental uh, degradation. Now, um, it might take such a, an effort again because what, what drives people uh, in this corporate leadership, as I understand it, is when the stakes are clear. The, things have to be very clear, black and white, you know? So when they see that survival is the issue, your survival is at stake. Short-term money might not get you the long-term growth, the long-term profitability that the, the, the that you want, then they will have to, uh, to change behavior. So I, I, I believe very well that uh, you know within a generation or so, you know we're in a transitional stage, the university system will have to upgrade the curriculum, the values, how they redefine the values of humanity of business. You know the income inequality that brings unrest in some places that uh, end up undermining the whole business environment. The uh, the uh, activities that doesn't account for for uh, environmental co consequences and, and i mentioned here that i teach at michigan here and uh, i travel africa very extensively in many documents in academia in policy documents on the continent esg is very is very uh, prominent uh, sdgs are very prominent when we come to the us here you barely see them in academia you barely hear universities talk about sdgs or esgs and they are they are, they are still the leaders and try and, and pay setters for the rest of what happens in academia or just uh, practice uh, around the world. So the, the rich countries, uh, eventually, they would have to see that, uh, the academic sector especially would, would have to see that, you know, they are training the leaders that have to provide the world that they envision for the future. And just short-term uh, profits might not be the only value that drives uh, business schools anymore. So, Bernard, you, you're talking about reputation management. Could could there be a factor they are driving businesses in the in the right direction based on what is seen as a good thing, uh, acting in a certain way as a leadership, or or also involving stakeholders, even customers in decision making? Is that something you you've experienced? Well, this very much depends on on uh, on a couple of factors. One is if you are acting in a, uh, let's say, in an industry which is exposed to risks, uh, uh, then obviously uh, management is very sensitive about, about issues and, um, and potential risks they have to be prepared for. Um, that's one thing, because 
the damage of a uh, of a crisis would harm their not only their reputation but their bottom line. Um, what I see is that um, privately owned companies are particularly particularly when their last name is the same uh, as the brand of the corporate of the corporate brand. They're particularly concerned about their reputation, and they're really prepared for 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 doing this um, long term and sustainable business approach. And, and finally, one term was mentioned a couple of times, which is purpose. And I think this is a key question these days: what are what does a company stand for? What are the values, and why should employees work for that company? And there must be a purpose beyond just making money. And once people understand this, um, they put the pressure within an um, employer branding strategy to really make a company change their purpose and act differently. The so behavior is what John said is key. And I think it has to be the power from the bottom to make the management and the corporate body change. And Christina, is this also something that your organization helps with? Is this actually something that you, you feel can be not only regulated, but also encouraged? We operate certainly within the regulatory context of present day. However, this is, you know, as a consultancy and as a reporting firm, we do have to maintain an objective and neutral stance. Our job is not to make companies more impactful. Our job is to help them, you know, within the context of their own ESG strategy. Um, and and that's that's bespoke. That's unique to each each business. Um, but I think, generally speaking, this is absolutely the trend that we're seeing across all corporates and across all industries and geographies. This is not a, this is not a U.S. phenomenon, um, and uh, obviously there are parts of the world where there is certainly more work to be done in the democratization of business. Um, and and hope that you know maybe we can touch upon the cultural aspects of that that um, you know make it easier or more challenging. Um, but um, but certainly even in in, in if I were to, um, you know, just be speaking about the the developed um, or Western culture, uh, I would say that this is this is absolutely something that's been embraced. It's an expectation. Um, it's something that shareholders put pressure on, and so companies are publicly shamed. And we're living in the age of you know the digital transformation. I think this is something that um, you know Sam can speak a lot to. But um, you know, a company can no longer you know. Years ago, no company would dress over John Smith having an opinion about their company. Today, John Smith has a voice by way of social platform. And so anything that compromises the, the democratic governance of a business um, in a way that is seen, you know, perceived as negative is going to be opined on by the general public. And that could certainly end up being sort of a groundswell that puts a company in a pretty calm, compromised position. So when you have this ability to speak up as uh, an influencer or as an employee, Sam, you mentioned that some of the decisions about, you know, returning to work, for instance, was laid out as a, as a collective decision in your company. Uh, can we not risk to end up in a situation where it's the loudest voice uh, actually making the decision and not the best decision per se? Um, I mean, I think that, and the beauty of technology is it gives us the tools to mitigate that problem fairly effectively. Um, now, obviously, some platforms, as we know, are better than others, right? We have an entire societal problem of their platforms that reward not the loudest voice, but the most extreme voice. Um, in business, at least internally, um, I think that, you know, we do have the ability to uh, utilize platforms that are more democratic. Um as far as, you know, as far as like in terms of things that we were talking about earlier, like reputation more broadly with customers in the market, that becomes a lot more tricky to manage. Um, I think some of the problems that, you know, Bernard was describing of like, how do you get, you know, large scale investors to focus less on, sh you know, sh very short term profits and, and, and shareholder value and focus more on the long term is very tricky. Um, in the games industry, we're lucky. Um, to some extent, because we produce entertainment. So ultimately, if we, we, as we've learned many times, and I have plenty of stories we can tell about this, but there have been plenty of examples in the games industry and other entertainment industries as well, where short-term thinking at the expense of the quality of the content, um, you know, generates some small amount of short-term benefit 
with terrible long-term outcomes. Um, and I think to a large extent, companies and leadership have seen that and have um, been a lot more careful about it. So when we are, when we do mitigate those problems and, and effects of that, um, what do we need to do with, with leaders who would actually like to work with this, but might be fearful? And I'm thinking about uh, you, John, here, and your challenging coaching book, but also on trust. What if, if they would like to, but they are fearful of it? And it's, mm. it's not, they, they have seen those examples where it was actually not. Yeah, I think, um, you know, you are the company you keep. And, and what, what we encourage with leaders who want to pioneer with this is to find a community um, of like-minded people because it's easier to be brave when you're doing it with other people. Uh, and it's easier to, um, you know, get feedback and be challenged and to, and to realize your own blind spots if you're working with, a, a, you know, a, a community of senior leaders that, that get this. Um, you know, I'd like to mention in that respect the, the B Corp um, initiative um, that certainly here in the UK is, uh, is is gaining rapid ground. More and more organizations wanting to certify B Corps, which is an independent verification of their uh, of, of the democratization of their businesses, uh, to use the language of this panel. And that is being used now as a differentiator um, in the marketplace uh, by those organizations. But it's also creating a community of leaders. And I, and I think I think that's going to be important for this to develop and, 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 and take hold is that, that we recognize that we, we need those communities uh, of leaders, you know, like Harassis is, is, is its own community. Uh, and I get a great sort of benefit from just spending time amongst, you know, the people tonight and the people at Harassis because it, it, it boosts my own um, commitment and my own uh, enthusiasm to say, you know, yes, there's something important here that not everybody believes it, but at least some of us, <laughs> at least some of us do. And, and uh, I think it's just uh, encouraging business leaders to uh, to get out of that, that boardroom, get out of that bubble and, and really have these conversations and, and get involved with, with these sorts of uh, communities, because I think that's going to be key to giving this momentum and, uh, and critical mass. So it's interesting, Kumba, you mentioned the geographical uh, differences you've seen. Uh, and it looks like you have something else you wanted to add on that. Yeah, I, I, know, I, I was going to mention that uh, this conversation, even though uh, the title says democratizing a uh, business, you know, those two words might start very conflicting. The word democracy will you know, suggest something that uh, might not even be, might be antithetical to business itself. But I think uh, it's more a matter, if well put, of you know, expanding the value system of a business in a way that it incorporates, it provides more value be, beyond just the, uh, the dollar bottom line to its stakeholders, to its um, investors, but the employees, the environment, the ecosystem that they function in, which in the end might also even make the company more profitable as opposed to the, the, the short term. So I think the, the, the word democratizing might bring certain nuances in itself, but just re seeing this within a larger context of how... Uh, as one as the planet becomes smaller, the world becomes a smaller and smaller village, and things are just overly in interconnected. Migrations, income um, uh, inequalities, environmental issues, healthcare, pandemics, all of this. Then the business sector that that dominates society, that determines even the political uh, systems. This need also, to, uh, I think, just to re rethink how do we now redefine things in a way that we incorporate elements that were not there. 200, 100 years ago when many of these theories were put in place, you know. So let's get some final remarks from each of you. So so what have you learned today? What's new to you in terms of, of this whole topic from you from the other panelists and also maybe some thoughts this uh, inspired in you? And Christina, why don't you start? Yeah, I, uh, I definitely spend a lot of time thinking about uh, as I said during my last point, how this industry, sorry, the the pressures of increased democratization is going to change industry um, norms and therefore ultimately some of the requirements uh, that are imposed upon them. Um, I, I think um, that's something that we need to certainly keep an eye on um, because it is, you know, companies are made up of individuals and we as human beings um, have difficulty with change. And so these cultural shifts 
um, changes in, in management style and leadership to provide opportunities and a voice for those within the organization. It is obviously, you know, by way of research we've seen is to their benefit. Um, more informed decisions, more comprehensive considerations are made on behalf of the business, ultimately leading to long-term success and sustainability. But uh, while we may know that, it's similar to knowing how we should eat and how we should exercise in order to have a healthier lifestyle. We know it, but we don't necessarily do it. So I think that's some of the challenge that lies ahead. Thank you. And what about you, John? What's your... Yeah, I mean, I, I take away, as I said, a lot of in, uh, of encouragement and, uh, you know, the diversity of, of the conversation that, w that we've got on the panel tonight. And I think, again, if we compare that with, with five years ago, I mean, terms like ESG, you know, we, we, we weren't using them five or six years ago. So, I mean, you know, th th there is definitely a lot more people getting involved, bringing different disciplines into this challenge. So I think it's a, a really exciting time. But I just to maybe close with a a little bit of a health warning that tomorrow morning I'm going to be presenting to 16 CEOs of small, medium sized businesses in here in the UK. And the last time I presented to a similar group and we talked about these sorts of trends, one of the CEOs um, sort of stopped uh, the presentation uh, and sort of banged his uh, fist on the table and said, John, we, we don't want these changes. We don't, we don't want this. We need to stop it. Um, you know, so we, we have to realize that a lot of people are, are threatened by these, um, these shifts. You know, th th they have, a lot of the leaders have been successful by doing it, you know, opposite sort of to the democratizing of business. And th those people are, are worried and they're, they're concerned. And, you know, I, I actually welcome the honesty of that uh, individual saying what he, what he said, because I know there are a lot of leaders thinking that at the moment. That they're feeling a little bit trapped. They're feeling a little bit like they're be they're becoming the the public enemy, and um, we need to we need to help we need to help that group also have a way forward through this and, and have a way of sort of uh, uh, transitioning in, in, into the into the world that's coming. Because if we don't, we we will have a we will have a bit of a fight on our hands, and and, and we don't really want to do this, you know, fighting yes. for it. We want to try and collaborate for it. Yeah acknowledging the starting point. And Bernard, what's your part? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm very grateful. I, I think this is, um, for me, it's an extremely important, this panel. I take a lot of takeaways for me from, uh, from, from the IT and digital transformation, from the education point of view, the leadership point of view, I think it's fantastic aspects. Um, you all mentioned, I think, if we talk about democracy, and democracy usually um, start from has its origin in, in the revolution, right? And my question is, if this process of democrat, well, democratization is a difficult word for me to pronounce, <laughs> is, is going fast enough? Because we see all the challenges, and um, uh, Kumba mentioned, and I think we see the pandemic, we see in the environmental issues, and so forth. And, and I don't see that process of change going fast enough. And I think we need more pressure from, from the bottom, from different stakeholder groups to make this, and not only talk about soft uh, words like uh, mm. purpose and so forth, but really see the change going fast. And if you look at the environment and the I, I, I really want to give the final word also to Sam and Kupa. So thank you so much, Sam. That's over to you. Sure. I think one of the things I've realized with all of this in this entire discussion, right, this has all been around, you know, democratization, but democratization doesn't seem like it's the goal. It seems like what we're all talking about here is democratization, democratization is a means to get businesses to focus on delivering social value at scale instead of just short term value to investors. And like, clearly that's the need. I'm, I, I'm coming out of this panel just a little bit more distraught because I'm hearing like, we need new economic theories from Kumba, but we don't have them. Um, and I, I'm struggling to see how we're going. Like, not everybody can make, can, you know, work at a company where we make games for doctors, right? The more money we make, the more social value we create. That's not going to work in a lot of other areas. And creating those economic incentives, it seems like we're still struggling to find a model for it. Yeah. And Kumba, I guess the last 30 seconds. It, yes. wouldn't work, it wouldn't work right away, my good friend, but these things are uh, issues of historical evolution. We cannot, it's, it's difficult to disrupt society, business practices, people's established norms quickly like that. But then one looks at how to transition over a generation or two so that the problems that are evident 
are being accommodated on the long run. For the short term, it's hard to think about it. But I'm, I'm, I, you know, it's been a pleasure being with the whole team.